Hello, my name is Lisa Shipper. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. I need to start by apologizing for not appearing in person because travel has become extremely difficult in my new job. I'm still grateful for the opportunity to contribute to the conference to this keynote, and I hope that it can be useful somehow for you. So today I'm going to be drawing on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report to emphasize a more integrated type of development that's necessary for moving forward to address our changing settlement patterns in the context of a changing climate. So I was coordinating lead author for the chapter on climate resilient development pathways that concluded the working group two report. That is, uh, working group two is the working group that focuses on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. I also want to acknowledge the contribution to this talk by my fellow IPCC author, David Dodman, who is the general director of IHS, the Institute of Housing and Urban Development Studies at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. So in addition to the IPCC AR6, thanks to David, this talk also draws on the IPCC summary for urban policymakers that was released at the end of last year and a report commissioned by the Global Commission on Adaptation in 2009. Let me start with the punchline from the AR6, which is located in the Working Group 2 Summary for Policymakers. The scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss the brief, rapidly closing window to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Most important in my view are the two final words for all, because the window of opportunity to act would probably be much larger if we didn't consider everyone. But honestly, the challenge is tremendous, especially when we consider the types of impacts that we're facing, which address water availability and food production, health and well-being, ecosystem structures, species ranges, and cities, settlements, and infrastructure. Further, climate change combines, combined with unsustainable use of natural resources, habitat destruction, deforestation, and growing urbanization, as well as inequity and marginalization. And these trends not only present threats to ecosystems and the people who rely on them, but also reduce the capacities of nature, of communities and individuals to adapt to climate change. We're increasingly living in a global world. There is extreme rapid urbanization, rapid urban population growth and spatial expansion. We have, we see this largely in geographical regions with limited financial and technical capacity. Here you can see that the, the largest growth has actually been in Asia and Africa. So this really puts emphasis on the need for high quality policy relevant urban research and a need for trained and skilled professionals to respond to these many challenges. But it's not an even global challenge. It's taking place in different places at different rates. And even more strikingly, the places where cities are growing the most rapidly are the places that are the least resourced. City budgets per capita can be almost 10,000 per year or less than 100. The challenge posed by urbanization has been recognized by all the countries around the world through the sustainable development goals, especially of concern is rapid urbanization accompanied by high levels of informality, inadequate housing, insufficient basic services. There is a specific SDG number 11 on cities and communities. But looking across the SDGs, we also see that urban, the kind of urban transitions required uh, to address multiple SDGs, poverty, SDG 1, energy, SDG 7, industry and infrastructure, SDG 9, inequalities, SDG 10, and of course, climate, SDG 13. So future urbanization will amplify the projected air temperature change in cities, regardless of the characteristics of the background climate, resulting in a warming signal on minimum temperatures that could be as large as the global warming signal. And we have very high confidence in this. Also compared to present day, large implications are expected from the combination of future urban development and more frequent occurrence of extreme climate events, such as heat waves with more hot days and warm nights adding to heat stress in cities. Here we also have very high confidence. The combination of extreme sea level increased by both sea level rise and storm surge and extreme rainfall or river flow events will increase the probability of flooding. Here we have high confidence. And there is also high confidence that 
in an increase of pluvial pl flood potential in urban areas where extreme precipitation is projected to increase, especially at high global warming levels. So if you haven't already grasped that the biggest challenge is presented in these multiple intersecting risks that are exacerbated by each other. We talk about this as cascading risks. And here's an example of how this might play out during, for example, an extreme heat event in a city such as a flood. So we have a flash flood that damages energy supply, for example, by flooding an electricity substation. This impact cascades to associated sectors and services such as transport, IT, and urban services, producing a compounded impact on social infrastructure, well-being, and future vulnerability. So in this case, we see how this cascades onto public services, which are compromised, and this leads to disruptive social services. The flood also causes broken power supply, which negatively affects IT by disrupting communication. And third, we see how the flood's impact on the energy supply leads to disruption of traffic management systems, which mean that goods and people are unable to travel. If we look at a slower onset event, um, so chronic, chronic climate impacts such as everyday flooding put pressure on social infrastructure over time. So it's not an immediate extreme impact. Strained livelihoods, health and education services challenge city budgets and place additional demands on formal services. And these impacts place further pressure on already constrained urban social infrastructure generating vulnerability. So here in this example, we see, for example, how um, th these kind of everyday flooding events contribute to the loss of human skills, for example, in IT, which leads to disruptive communication and also re result in failure of maintenance. Uh, so the nature-based solutions result in the erosion of social well-being rather than helping to actually make things worse. Or if you look at a reduced budget that is a consequence of having to put money into constantly addressing these, these uh, everyday flooding events, um, a reduced budget is then available for transport systems, which means that goods and people are unable to travel. So in many different ways, we see both sort of these extreme events and also in the slow onset events, the cascading impacts that have ultimately very, very difficult uh, and kind of undermining effects. And so beyond that, what are the drivers of, um, of urban vulnerability? And the report that was commissioned by the Global Commission on Adaptation in 2019 identified seven key drivers. So in ecosystems, I talk about how ecological systems can harness the benefits of ecosystem characteristics and services to manage risk and build resilience. Uh, and they, these key ecological solutions combine adaptation with the protection of waterways, coastlines, forests, mangroves, and natural areas. Uh, further, we can look at infrastructure such as physical engineered infrastructure that, that uh, reduces exposure in a city or a neighborhood, or critical infrastructure that can build adaptive capacity such as energy grids and transport networks. But these are all very sensitive as well and important to, to maintain and protect. If we look at social systems, we can see here, especially these sort of providing formal and informal links between people and their communities, and these are critically important. Uh, social cultural relationships that provide social assistance and resource support, such as social safety nets, community-based networks, and civic organizations. We can also look to politics and political arrangements that serve as a more structured form of, of decision-making, either within government or between government and const constituents, or other kinds of mechanisms for transparency and accountability. Obviously, communication is important and communication infrastructure that includes things like networks and pathways of knowledge and data dissemination through web-based platforms or internet or social media is really important, increasingly important. Uh, and many of these things support planning and regulatory functions, as well as knowledge and awareness campaigns. And then finally, finance, of course, we can't have this discussion without finance. Financial systems include actors and institutions, nodes, networks, and pathways of resource transfer. And here we can talk about multilateral finance or intergovernmental arrangements, banks, savings groups, social insurance, insurance, development aid, philanthropy, training, and job, job and skill training. Looking at heat waves in cities gives us a really good understanding of what the impacts are. Uh, David Dodman identified in his work, a recent paper, that actually informal workers are essential for functioning in urban economies. And, and um, 
the problem is that many of these people tend to be very exposed and not informed of the impacts of heat. And so what we see is that there's actually reduced productivity, decreased well-being, exhaustion, cardiovascular stress, a lot of people working in, in the sun, um, standing outside, not covering their heads, and dehydration can lead to kidney damage. Uh, and we then see how this climate risk combined with other risks from unsafe working conditions. And this has obviously impacts on household income and well-being because of productivity is affected and health is affected because of heat. The problem is that informal workers tend to be people who have come from outside the city who may not actually be formally registered in the city and therefore they're often excluded from social protection. But um, informal workers are not the only group that are especially sensitive. We can also look to uh, gender issues. So women are particularly affected as well. Uh, damage to homes and neighborhoods often affects women's incomes more because income earning activities are often undertaken at home. And uh, they tend to rely more on natural resources. And women often also suffer a lot from relocation, the lack of safety and security that uh, that exists in temporary uh, accommodation that comes with sort of moving into an urban area. Of course, there's always uh, there's always vulnerability associated with being in a caretaking uh, position because we always have then to consider other people who are taking care of children or or elder people. Uh, so childbearing and domestic responsibilities also lead to the fact that we sometimes not have access to water or food or sanitation because we have to be in a certain place and we can't leave the home, we can't go to the water source. And all of these things tend to be exacerbated by underlying economic disadvantages, including limited access to resources, uh, limited access to health care and health facilities and dependency on uh, male family members. So what I painted so far, I think, is quite a grave situation of what we're looking at, these multiple risks intersecting in, in many different ways. And yes, the situation is bad and it's exacerbated by the fact that we're also really doing very badly when it comes to responding to these problems. But there are improvements that can be made and actually rather easily. So there are options we can take for reducing the risks to people and nature by climate change. Climate resilient development integrates adaptation and mitigation to support sustainable development. And we talk about climate resilient development as being a different type of development. It really emphasizes things like improving people's health and livelihoods, reducing poverty and hunger, providing clean energy, water and air, while simultaneously considering that the climate is changing and that any kinds of decisions have to take that as well as development needs into account. So if you kind of unpack this more simply, we know that climate change is happening and that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we also know that there are many people who still need to develop and thus we still need to pursue sustainable development. However, this development will need to be low carbon so that it does not contribute any additional emissions, right? I think that makes sense. However, because we already have the impacts of climate change, this development needs to integrate risk. That is, it also needs to include adaptation. So consequently, this is what we mean when we talk about climate resilient development. It's that climate action in combination with sustainable development. Yet, going back to my first slide, time is not on our side. So we don't have the chance to really sit down and figure out exactly how does all this puzzle together. There is increasing urgency and actually, for every action that we take now and every decision matters for putting us on a pathway towards climate resilient development. Uh, we, we, as you can see from these pathways, we can still make wrong choices even if we start off well. So worldwide action is more urgent than previously thought. So how do we do this? Of course, we have a number of thoughts about this. If we think about starting with cities, it's clear that we have to transform cities somehow. And cities can be a really good opportunity for, for addressing or for, for, for um, really developing climate resilient development futures. 2050 urban areas could be home to two thirds of the world's population. So this is why cities matter so much in thinking about climate resilient development. So effective options include things like nature-based and engineering approaches that are combined. 
also establishing green and blue spaces and urban agriculture, which is going to be necessary, especially as more people are living in cities, we need more food and we can't constantly rely on food coming from outside. We also need social and safety nets for disaster management. And this is particularly the case where we have a lot of rapid urbanization, a lot of people coming into places uh, where these safety nets, that where they haven't already established the safety nets or they've moved away from their existing safety nets. So the wider benefits of these kinds of approaches is that we have generally public health improvement and ecosystem conservation happening at the same time. But we know that cities are not all just formal with processes and people in places where they're supposed to be. We also have a tremendous amount of informal settlements around the world. So here, what are the kinds of things that we need to think about to think about how to adapt actually include, include really capturing that local knowledge, what people understand, how they live, and making sure that that, 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 that context is integrated into any decision and planning. There needs to be adequate capacity, and this includes things like information, funding, and tools. Obviously, funding is a tremendously important uh, part of this. But there also needs to be engagement of policymakers rather than just sort of ignoring the fact that these informal settlements uh, exist. They actually need to be part of the decision-making process because the more they're marginalized, the worse situations become for them. So that means involvement of the residents in decision-making processes. But we also need to see institutional change where there's more accountability and commitment and also transparency about the decision-making processes. So when I talk about adaptation and climate resilient development, the kinds of changes that we need are not just incremental. So we know that there could be a big difference if we approach adaptation as something that should be transformative, rather that changes systems rather than simply incremental, sort of building on small, small steps on, on top of each other. Because with an incremental approach, we might consider only near-term risks, existing infrastructure, and just adding to business as usual development plans. However, with a transformative approach, we'd be looking more holistically, and for example, to ensure integrity of urban and, and regional ecosystems in ways that would in turn support new communities, institutions, and economies. And this would require new people-centric city planning that also seeks to address underlying inequalities, which in turn produces behavior and lifestyle changes that can ensure better stewardship of ecosystems. And on we go in this way, which involves deep long-term systemic change. And at this point, this is really the only type of approach that we can afford because we don't have the time to sit around and wait for these small, short incremental solutions to work. This type of approach is really grounded in a, a perspective of equity and justice. And so we therefore talk about just adaptation planning. And here we're talking about, um, therefore, broadening participation in urban adaptation planning, as I've already mentioned, catalyzing, um, sorry, and this prioritizes the needs of marginalized populations. So next week, catalyze adaptation planning across cities, and this means extending lessons to smaller or less wealthy cities. So it's not always the mega cities or the larger cities that get all of the attention. Further, we need to scale adaptation justice through multi-level and multi-scalar governance, which requires appropriate policy and planning tools. And finally, designing for spatial justice beyond the traditional large-scale master planning, we really need to consider what do the spaces, the urban spaces mean for men and for women and for different communities to ensure safety and security and well-being for all. And I just want to emphasize how incredibly important this meaningful participation is, because we've seen in many studies that I've been involved in as well, that actually uh, a lot of adaptation goes wrong. That is, it becomes maladaptive when we don't involve local people and we don't involve local knowledge in the planning processes. So that means a consideration of the needs of the vulnerable residents, the social, economic, and political interests of the urban poor, the underrepresented minorities, and other vulnerable and marginalized groups. It also means procedural representation and equity, the degree to which all urban public, private, and civil society actors adequately participate in the adaptation process. So it's not just being in a room, but actually having the, the comfort and feeling that you can actually participate in the discussion and the conversation. 
And then, of course, ensuring just adaptation outcomes, the degree to which formal or institutionalized adaptation projects and programs achieve just results. So here we really want to end on, I think, three opportunities that are important. And the first one is the, the opportunity of adapting natural infrastructure. So um, here we can see the importance of well-functioning ecosystems in buffering communities and infrastructure from hazards. And there's demonstrated effectiveness in temperature regulation, air quality regulation, stormwater regulation, coastal flood protection, river flood protection, water provision and management, food production, and security that comes from this. So this requires us, if we think about adaptation, uh, to have well-functioning ecosystems that can buffer communities and infrastructure from hazards. Um, and um, also we need to think about uh, how in terms of inclusion, how the urban poor have fewer options for temperature regulating and cooling when it gets very hot or very warm, uh, cold, sorry. And uh, often that these people are located on marginal land, especially close to rivers and coasts where other people don't want to live. And how might, might we be able to provide opportunities for sustainable livelihoods through these ecosystems based solutions? And of course, what is the potential for lower costs that could be attractive to the most more marginalized and poorer people? So if you look at these ecosystem-based or nature-based solutions, um, we talk about increasing tree cover, we talk about community gardens, greening rooftops, increasing permeable surfaces and uh, other kinds of uh, protection. When there are plenty of examples around the world where these where these kinds of measures have already been implemented uh, and, and they have a positive impact. So if we look at the opportunity that's posed by adapting infrastructure, physical infrastructure, well, we, we need an integrated approach, right? Cities are made up of physical infrastructure, natural infrastructure and social infrastructure. So um, we need to think about none of these is on their own going to solve the problem. So in terms of physical infrastructure, I think the thing that stands out the most is probably housing and building design and construction, including things like passive cooling, which we know is going to be increasingly important in many parts of the world. But obviously energy infrastructure matters. And here's really where we have the opportunity to think about adaptation and mitigation, supporting sustainable development, so climate resilient development. Things like IT infrastructure, uh, transportation, water and sanitation, and coastal management are also all part of this. Uh, but here, in terms of thinking about inclusion, we need to think about what's actually you know, affordable and unaffordable of basic services and infrastructure. So water and sanitation, who has access to this? What is the significance of, of housing for both shelter and livelihoods? Can people work in one place and live somewhere else or should their livelihoods be closer to home? Furthermore, reliance on public infrastructure for livelihoods so that we need to make sure that there is energy and transport available for everybody. Then finally, if we think about uh, adapting a social infrastructure, here, there are essentially three areas where we can look for adaptation. We think about land use planning, so here we want to reduce human nature negative trade-offs and spatial inequality. In terms of livelihoods and social protection, we need to consider safety nets, social insurance, labor market policies, and livelihood development. And finally, health, preventative measures, improving resilience of health infrastructure, treating climate-related illness. And I think this is something, for example, in uh, many parts of Northern Europe, we're now recognizing that uh, and health professionals need to understand what heat stroke looks like. Health professionals need to be able to treat dehydration immediately because these are many things that health professionals, for example, in the UK or Sweden have not seen that frequently. So they don't necessarily know these symptoms. Um, but also when we think about this from an inclusion perspective, we need to remember that all of these strategies need to also reduce vulnerability and that these will be different levels for different types of people. Uh, so I wanted to conclude with just saying that, you know, I hope to given you an overview of the kinds of things that uh, are coming from the IPCC report, trying to focus this around climate resilient development as a way forward for combining all these different elements that are really necessary to be able to, to achieve a sustainable and a livable future uh, for all 
Thank you.